Uh, welcome those of you in the room and welcome those of you joining us online. Uh, this is the first of our nautical education series for the season. And we're starting this off with a presentation uh, on getting preparing for your first MAC race. Uh, I'm Sam Veyu, chairman of the race, and I'm happy to welcome you here today. Uh, today we have two great sessions. We have the first session on uh, preparing for your first MAC race, and then uh, we have a, a second session at 3 p.m. Central today with Dobbs Davis uh, from ORC Ratings. Also, please join us next week. Uh, we have a presentation on the updated Chicago Mackinac safety regulations and a presentation from Phil Pollard of Crowley's Yacht Yard. Uh, I'd also like to thank our race sponsors. First of all, we have Wintrust returning as our presenting sponsor. We're also welcoming back Mount Gay Rum and Team One Newport. And we're proud to announce today uh, for the first time Crowley's Yacht Yard as the official safety sponsor of the race. So, Adam, can you go to the next slide? So before we get started with the panel today, uh, we have a few announcements. Uh, first of all, we have a new online registration system. As many of you know, uh, our friend and fellow racer, Louis Call, passed away unexpectedly last year. Uh, in addition to running yacht scoring, uh, he also developed and maintained our race management application for the race. Uh, we've been working with another vendor on that. We're gonna be launching the uh, new race uh, to Mackinac uh, race management system and sign up process on February 1st. Uh, it's undergoing the final testing right now. Second of all, I'm pleased to announce for the first time today that rafting at the Mackinac Island State Harbor is back. Uh, the number one concern last year uh, from our survey results was that the lack of dockage at Mackinac Island uh, due to the limits that the Michigan DNR put on us of one boat per slip. So I, along with the Chicago Yacht Club flag officers, have been working diligently for many months with stakeholders, including the Mackinac Island City Council, the Mackinac Island Tourism Bureau, Michigan State Waterways Commission and others. And we're pleased to announce that we've reached an agreement with the Michigan DNR to have capacity in the Harbor, similar to what we had in 2019 and years past. Uh, so with that, we'll still have our overflow dockage uh, on the uh, ferry dock and the city docks, as well as uh, further overflow to the uh, Mac City and St. Ignace Harbors. We'll have some other improvements with additional restroom facilities at the harbors, uh, and there will be a few other changes that we'll be announcing uh, going forward. Uh, we're also excited to announce that we'll be moving the Sailor's Celebration to Mission Point. <clears throat> More details about that coming soon. And uh, we have a few changes and additions to the Chicago Mackinac safety regulations. Uh, including uh, the requirement for the personal AIS MOB beacons. Uh, we have a session next week, uh, 2 p.m. on the 22nd, where we'll be discussing that in detail. Please join us next week uh, for that session uh, for the, to discuss the safety regulations, as well as uh, have the Life Jacket Clinic uh, and Gear Expo from Phil Pollard. So with that, I'd like to introduce our participants for today. Uh, Jim Armstrong, or Stretch, has done 35 MAC races along with many other distance races, including the Transpac. Uh, he completed his first MAC race when he was 16 and has done the race on everything from the 33-foot to 70-foot yachts. Uh, Steve Sickler has done 42 MAC races, a dozen pure Port Huron races, uh, and he's actually done a bunch of them with Stretch. Uh, Steve's currently uh, an owner of Dakota, Beneteau 47.7, and I had the pleasure of sailing with him and his crew last year in the race. Uh, Nancy Snyder has done 31 MAC races. She ran her pro own program on a T10 for many years uh, and has nine section wins, uh, wins to show for that. And Adam Collins uh, is from our MAC uh, Committee Communications Subcommittee, will be our moderated, moderator today. He's completed seven MAC races and actually bought his current boat from Nancy. And I've had the pleasure of sailing uh, several inshore buoy races with Adam. So just to recap, uh, stretch sail with Steve and Nancy sold her boat to Adam. So we're just keeping it all in the family here. So with that, let's get going.
And if you need an invitation, if you're a first time uh, loser for Mac race, first time boat owner, you can, uh, you can log on to the, to the site there and request an invitation, which leads me to a quick question. I got it. Thanks, Ray. Stretch, we're gonna move you. Hold on. I'm gonna try to unstretch you. <laughs> Adam, actually, I need oh. to ask you this, but nobody could hear the last three slides. Can you start over? Sure, real quick. You got it. Isn't tech fun, everyone? <laughs> All right, real quick. February 1st is the key date. Invitations will be scheduled to be issued on February 1st. You can start um, submitting your entry uh, information on February 1st, request for, inf uh, for an invitation or a change of boat for those of you uh, who, uh, for whom that would apply. If you are invited, but you don't get an email from, uh, from the uh, race committee, uh, you can log on to the profile uh, on February 1st and start the entry process. That's really the, really the key date. It's coming up obviously pretty quick. So please uh, mark your calendars. And then just to recap on this, I will move your stretch. Well, yeah, I'm gonna try that here. Stretch may be where he is for right now. Um, Sam can move it, but I'll, I'll just keep talking through this piece. And, um, please, when you go into your, to your race profile, your crew profile, thanks buddy. Um, that's the chairman's duty right there. Yes. Uh, when you go into your crew profile, please make sure it's up to date um, with your safety at sea courses taken, the number of nights, overnight races you've done, uh, the applicable races of 24 hours or more, 100 nautical miles. Uh, again, make sure that your cell phone number and your email is up to date and that it is unique to your own profile so that your emergency contact is not yourself because that, um, that won't work. Real quick on the um, Mac safety regulations. I love the pictures in this, by the way, the, the club's got done a really nice job with the pictures. Makes me wanna go sailing. It's much better to look at that than it is to look outside the window here where it's very cold. Um, Real quick, these are some of the basics on the CMSRs and the safety requirements. At least two thirds of the crew has to practice within six months of the race, uh, man overboard procedures. If you look at the CMSRs, there are a lot of specifics about what types of procedures there are to do. There's a form that people have to fill out and sign, uh, but make sure that you've got, you keep that in mind. because It's, it's uh, obviously critical from a safety standpoint and it's required to get your boarding passes uh, to, uh, to do the race. Your PFDs have to be worn from, sun, from sunset to sunrise. 
And it's up to the person in charge of the boat as to whether or not they, should, they need to be uh, worn uh, during the day on your boat. I know different boats have different, uh, different rules about how they handle that. Um, at least 50% of your crew, this is an important one, at least 50% of your crew, including the person in charge and the watch captain, has to have a valid safety at sea certificate. Again, there's more detail on this uh, in the CMSRs, which you, which you can see, but um, there are a lot of really good sessions uh, run by uh, US Sailing. Highly recommend the, the two-day version uh, as opposed to the one-day uh, one version, although a one-day version will get you a valid uh, certificate. Uh, and then this year and we, online. yeah, correct. Yeah, and they do offer an online one for folks uh, recognizing uh, COVID and some of the challenges that folks have uh, right now. So they do offer an online version of it, which will also uh, get you a valid uh, cert uh, certificate. Um, and then finally, as Sam uh, alluded to, there is a, a new uh, requirement this year that uh, all, um, everyone's got a personal AIS uh, MLB device. Uh, there'll be a lot more discussion about that. Uh, uh, next Saturday. Uh, so please join us there and we'll take some more questions about the uh, safety regulations and some of the new elements uh, next Saturday. So look forward to seeing everyone there. Can you move uh, stretch there? All right, we're moving stretch so he doesn't cover up the important dates. He's, he's, gonna he's get bouncing seasick. around. You're all over the place. He's going to get seasick. That's right. It's <laughs> a good one. Um, important dates. We've got some key ones up here. As I mentioned, February 1st, uh, uh, NOR is up and the registration is open. There's an early bird deadline coming up a few months later. Registration deadline. There is a late entry deadline as well. Um, and then we got to move them back. Sorry. This looked really cute when we built the slides this way that they were one and then the other. Sorry, Stretch. <laughs> <laughs> um, on the island, the race itself, um, there's a warning gun party on the 21st this year. The, um, there's registration on the cruiser skipper meeting. That would be the Thursday evening. And the 22nd, the, the Friday is when cruising divisions start. For fo so for folks out there who have cruising boats or who may be a crew on a cruising boat, that, uh, that's a, obviously a key date for you. Uh, for folks who are in the racing divisions, um, uh, the performance divisions, there is a party here on Friday night and a skipper's meeting. And then on Saturday, the 23rd, will be the start of the uh, performance uh, divisions. I like to say that, Nancy, because the T10s are qualifying the performance division. Yeah, you bet. Hey, Adam, can yes. you go back one slide? There was a request to go back a slide just All so right. they could see the dates again. Yes, happy to do that. There you go. <laughs> Well, they can see him, but not in front of the one. Okay, perfect. Moving on. All right. Let's move forward to the next one. So you stay there. And then on the island, there's the there's the porch, uh, porch party is on uh, Sunday. We've got the sailors celebration on Tuesday, which is a great time. Hope to see uh, hope to see a lot of your faces out there. And for folks on Zoom, maybe we'll meet you. Um, <laughs> Round the Island race on the 27th, and then the MAC uh, Awards Banquet. Yeah, we got pink out there, right? It's nice, yeah. Um, there's more information. Uh, all of this stuff is housed on the, uh, on the MAC race website, so you can check it out there. Um, there's a, it's a great uh, deal of information about the different, um, different elements of the race and the different times and uh, different, different core dates. Question, the porch party is still at the, mat, at the Grand, yes? yes? Porch party is still at the Grand. Okay, yes. all right. And then the, and then the sailor celebration, celebration which is on Tuesday. You get to do the whole is island. We get to year. see everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. And there are bars in between, I've heard. I don't know. <laughs> All right. So, do you want to ask who in the room? I was just, yeah. yep, exactly. So, for folks, I can't see you online, but raise your hands along with us. For folks in the room, uh, raise your hand if you've never done the Mac race before. Awesome. That's great. Love to see it. Raise your hand. The opposite question now should be the other rest of you. If you have done the Mac race, all right? Keep them up if you've done the Mac race oh, as an- I put my hand up yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you've done the race as an owner or as a partner. Excellent. That's great. It's important as we go through this uh, because, you know, as we talk about, uh, as, the, as the panel gets into some of the discussion here, the way you think about getting ready for the race is going to be different as a crew than it is as an owner and or a partner. And obviously the 
the responsibilities are a lot higher and a lot greater for folks who are partners and owners. So something to keep in mind as, as, as we go through the conversation here with, uh, with Stretch and Steve uh, and Nancy. So with that, I'm going to get into it. Oh, boy. He can stay over there from, from, from here forward. So, um, so the, one of the core questions to ask is, are we ready to do the MAC race? Are we ready? Is the boat ready? Is the boat capable? Is it seaworthy? And is the crew ready? Um, so Nancy, if, if I can start with you, if that's okay, and I'll hand you the mic so you don't have to yell. Um, um, wanted to, to, I know you had some, we had some conversation a little earlier about some of your thoughts about making sure your boat's ready and making sure your, your crew is ready. I'll pass this down to you there. Great. So of course, the first thing is the crew, in my mind, is the crew ready to sail together in a distance race that will at some point go across open water at which you cannot see land. And I, my preference always is to race the whole season with the crew that is gonna do the MAC with you. If that can't be done, then you have to try as best you can to figure out a way for your crew to do some races with you prior to the MAC. So, you know, hopefully it's the Michigan City race, which is around a buoy and back, but it's at night, you get all conditions. It's a great opportunity to get everybody's head in the game, but at least some racing so that everybody on the boat is very familiar with where things are and familiar with each other. Um, getting the boat ready, and we can all talk about this, but getting the boat ready, going through the safety regs and what the requirements are, not just the owner, but also the crew. We used to have everybody on the boat at, down at one time to go through everything so that everyone knows where everything is. Steve, okay. any points? <laughs> well, I think there's a big difference between racing around the buoys and the Mac race. And I think the biggest difference between the, the two uh, events is sailing at night. So if you're a driver and you're sailing at night, you have a, a lot fewer clues to look at to keep the boat going fast and even just to keep the boat going safe. And uh, I think as a, as a person in charge or invited competitor, the primary responsibility is the safety of a crew, not necessarily making the, the boat win its division or something like that. One person has to be very concerned about safety and, it, and it's you as, as, the, uh, as the person in charge. So if you're driving the boat at night and you have a shoot up, it's easy to get all crossways about where the wind's coming from and have an accidental jibe. And if you're looking for uh, trouble, if you have an unexpected job, there's a, that's a, a lot of things that go wrong with that. That's when people can fall overboard and that sort of thing. So I highly recommend that you do with as many of your crew as possible a night race before and get everybody that's going to drive a chance to drive and experience those conditions. Um, as I was getting ready for this thing, I thought about more of the mistakes I made and the smart things <laughs> I did. And uh, uh, Stretch and I did a trans pack and you had to qualify by doing a 200 mile Pacific race and what we were doing is we were sailing from uh, San Francisco down to Monterey Bay. And it was at night and we're coming into Monterey and that sea shelf comes and there's big waves. Matter of fact, the boat got pooped. I felt a wave hit the back of my legs and we were jibing and I had everybody stand up uh, as we were doing the jibe in the middle of the night and I couldn't see the instruments. I was losing track of where I was. And usually in a at night, you can look up at your Windex. That's the one thing you can really trust. That tells you where the wind's coming from. You can't sail to your instruments. There's a lag on it, and it, it's, you're going to get all screwed up if you try to sail to your, your instruments. So I was looking at that thing, and the boat was bouncing around so much. The thing was swinging around. I still got lost, and, and, uh, and I broached the boat. And one crew member who was saying it up, she slid and was going to go through the lifelines into the specific ocean in the middle of the night when another crew member grabbed her. So I'm just telling you that story. It's, it's so important to, to uh, get some experience sailing at night. And that's my story. <laughs> I see, I see. Do you want to? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Stretch, do you want to talk a little bit about um, spreading experience over watches and just making sure that you've got enough folks who are capable and prepared uh, across, the, uh, across the watch schedule? Yeah, so um, it's really key. And you know, it, you wanna race with friends. Um, I've been fortunate as, as you uh, was shared to do 35 races. And for a minimum of 33 of those, I was doing it with friends, uh, family and et cetera. And that's what made it fun. Uh, but fortunately they all were, you know, regular sailors and, and had experience. My very first Mac race, 
I was invited at 16 from, uh, to, by uh, the, the father of a friend. I didn't realize I was getting onto a boat with a group that really just was trying to escape uh, time at home uh, drinking. Uh, and hey, I'm no stranger to having a drink, but um, it started at nine in the morning and it, it only stopped if somebody passed out. And I, find my, I found myself at 16. Uh, after the first night, I, I went down for a couple hours and I came back up on deck and I, I took a look at the binnacle compass. The guys, there were two guys back there. They were just roaring, laughing, having a great time. We were going southeast. I mean, not like, you know, not like, not like a hundred. I mean, I'm talking like 130 uh, on the compass. I'm like this. So I, so I, I politely asked if I could, if I could drive for a while and I never let go, I never let go again. Um, so uh, that continued until um, this was a year that I was, if I wasn't the pickle boat, I was damn close. Um, that continued until we got into the Straits uh, and I had never really been through the Straits before, but um, I had the chart and everyone just was asleep. Everyone passed out. And um, fortunately, I had been sailing for a long time at 16 that I was able to, to navigate. And I was able to uh, see a, a couple of stern lights, not bow lights, but stern lights that sort of guided me a little bit. But I mean, it was really key in terms of who do you have with you? Because otherwise it really can be dangerous. And so um, in thinking about who you're going to have with you, um, I would definitely make sure you, you try and find at least, if you can have four drivers, um, it's not only going to make it more competitive um, for you, but it's also going to make it safer. So to the degree that it's you or another that does most of the driving on the team or on the boat, you need to find windows where you can get other people onto the helm or perhaps ask someone else from another boat that might not be racing that has the experience so that you know the boat can always be handled no matter the conditions. Um, you're gonna need some strength on any boat. I'm not particularly a big guy. Um, usually I'm one of the smaller guys on the boats that I sail on, um, but strength is key. Um, in, in heavy air, uh, the loads on any boat, whether it's a laser or it's a 70 footer, uh, grow exponentially. And you've got to make sure that you've got a couple people that can be your, your workhorses and be thoughtful about how you use them. You, you, can't, you can't afford to wear them out. Um, you're going to want to be thinking about splitting these people up on your watches. We typically run um, watches that overlap with someone coming on fresh every hour. Um, so we're, we're usually four per, you know, three people on a watch split four ways. So there's 12 of us when we're racing um, you know, like a real offshore long distance race. Max sometimes will sail with 10. Um, but the idea is that there's always a body or two coming up fresh every hour and then someone else going down. And that way you're able to relay to the people coming up what's been going on, not four people have been on, here's what's going on, good luck, I'm going to bed. If there's always some continuity going on so that you can make sure that everybody understands the game plan. I think those would be things to focus on. Be thoughtful about who you ask, make sure you divide their skills up well, not just who you want to sail with on your watch, but think about how they balance one another and then make sure your watch schedule allows for some regular rotation, not all on, all off, all on, all off. That, that last formula doesn't work well. That's awesome. Just one thing that Stretch mentioned that I think was a really good point I wanted to to dive in on a little bit is making sure you've got enough drivers. You know, um, you think about some of the races, if you've done a distance race or if you've done buoy racing, you know, one or two drivers, totally fine. And Michigan City is a great example. When you're doing a race, it might take you two or three days, depending on how much wind there is and how fast your boat is. Um, you know, having having a third and fourth driver is, is really helpful. Um, you know, if you get tired, if there's, if there's heavy weather, if there's heavy seas. So um, that's a, it's a really good point, Jim. Can I expand on that a little yeah. bit? Yeah. I think the safest way to run a, run a boat is you have four really good sailors that can do everything. That is, they can drive, they can navigate, they know how to trim sails, they know how the, uh, the four deck crew is organized and all that. The reason I'm saying that, each watch should have two of those guys. So when one guy's driving, you really have to concentrate on driving, you really shouldn't be looking at anything else. So the second guy who knows what's going on can watch everybody out in the crew. You're going to have less experienced people. They can talk them through them. We're going to jive. I want you to do this. You know, you pull it in two feet. You're going to need a handle, you know, get ready, stand this way. 
run all that stuff. And that's, that's the safest way to run a boat. You can't do it all yourself. You just can't, it's just too much. You wanna yeah, one, one last point on that. And I think this is, this is key too. On a Mac race, it's not a buoy race. Reality, nothing needs to happen immediately. I mean, if it's an emergency, fine, things have to happen immediately. But most maneuvers, you can slow it down, talk through it, take time, make sure that everybody knows exactly what they're going to do. It's a long race, right? Be thoughtful about your maneuvers. Don't rush them. Make sure people know what they're doing so no one gets hurt. I will add to that. Yeah. And adding to that, that when you're sailing in cold conditions or rough conditions and people have been sitting on the rail for a while, build in that extra five minutes, seven minutes, eight minutes to let people get up off the rail and get their legs working and get their hands working. Uh, if you're driving the boat and your back is to the wind, it's a lot warmer than when you're sitting on the rail and all those <laughs> waves are coming at you. So uh, just keep that in mind as you're planning maneuvers. It takes people a long time to get off the rail and get warmed up and head back in it and be able to do something. That's great. I'm just going to keep going through. Like I said, if you've got, if folks have questions, feel free to, you know, if you're in the room, pop up your hand and we'll, we'll uh, take them. Or if you're online, uh, submit it to, and Taylor will, will, uh, will uh, flag it for us. Um, next is sort of similar to where we were just talking about here is a, po a approach to, to, to boat prep. And Nancy, if I can start with you, um, one of the things when, when, when I, when I bought the boat from Nancy, she talked about was belts and suspenders and making sure that you've really got your, your act together and, and you know the boat, you know the gear. Um, so Nancy, you know, sort of in, this, in the vein of sweating the small stuff, making sure you're ready, if, if you don't mind kicking us off there. So um, it's not just the responsibility of the owner to do these things. It's also the responsibility of the crew to get the boat ready and to know where things are. One of my favorite stories that I always tell my crew that Ted Jones told me, who's here in the room, uh, the inspection team that is up on the island awaiting the boats arriving, if you get scheduled for an inspection, it very well could be that the inspector will hand a bucket to the least experienced looking person and say, get these seven things and I'm timing you. So it is important that everybody on the crew knows where everything is on the boat. Now, not just for the inspection, but of course, if there's an emergency and they need to know where to find it, you don't want them asking, where are the bolt cutters? Where, where, where did those go? How do you do the emergency rudder? People need to practice these things. It gives them confidence. It gives you confidence. And uh, everybody should know how to operate the boat in any kind of weather. Um, so knowing where all the safety equipment is and drilling it into people was something I always did as a boat owner. I, on the T-10, would keep all, almost all the safety gear on starboard and I would tell everybody, guest or crew alike, S is for safety is for starboard. S is for safety is for starboard. So the, if they couldn't remember anything else, they would go to look on the starboard side of the boat first to try to find something related to safety. So it was really important to me that everybody knows where everything is. Uh, here's another pro tip for a crew that have not done the Mac before. It's going to get cold and you don't expect it. You're used to, you know, these warm temperatures and sun and all that stuff. You get up the north part of the lake at night and it's raining or something. The coldest I've ever been in my life has been on a sailboat because you're just sitting there. You typically aren't moving around a lot. So make sure you bring, you know, a set of, fleece underwear and, and some good foul weather gear and hats and pack your stuff. I pack all my stuff in garbage bags before I put it in the seat bag because if it's raining, everything gets wet, every crew gear gets thrown down below, your stuff can get dumped out, keep your crew bag zipped up because you could tack and it dumps out in the sole and there's water down there and you, you know it's miserable if you've got wet clothes all the time. So that's something to watch. Steve, I, I know. Yeah. I'm just looking at the slide to see the points on the slide. <laughs> One of them is practice, practice, practice. Um, not only the man overboard drill, but uh, I recommend practicing how to steer the boat uh, without a rudder because we've had it happen to boats on the race that you lose the rudder. Um, also, what was my point going to be? Oh, reefing practice. I sailed with a friend for, to stretch his point, a friend who was a very accomplished sailor for a very long time. And he would always tell the newer crew to know that the helm will ask for a reef 
five minutes too late. <laughs> so you should be prepared to get up there and get the sails reefed in the worst weather possible. So the best time to practice reefing is not when you're at the dock in the harbor, but on a really crummy day when you're out there and after the race or, or between races, have the crew practice reefing in really tough conditions. One of the things that a lot of people don't know how to do or do well in really rough conditions is rolling the sail up onto the boom and, and securing it down. And a lot of newer sailors might not think that's important to do until that part of the sail fills with water and rips or catches the wind and pulls the boat over or any sort of things can happen. So practicing how to safely shorten sail is something that everybody doing the race should have an opportunity to do in rough weather. And speaking of shorten, shorten sail, one of the smartest things that I've done over the years is you get to shoot down early. Um, we've made bigger leaps ahead of other competitor boats by having to shoot down early, sailing under control when the thunderstorm hits, instead of waiting to the last minute, because it tends to be a panic thing. That's when things go bad on you. But you get to shoot down, you get a head sail up. You can, you, it's, a, it's amazing how fast you can go when it's blowing 40 knots or something like that. So um, a great safety thing is the XM weather radio module, which you can add onto your plotter. And it shows you the bad stuff that's coming at you and you can kind of time it when it's going to, go to happen, you know, 50 minutes from now. So you can time that thing and do it, you know, so that you're still reasonably going fast, almost as if you're in a course race. But that's when you get in trouble if you leave that shoot up too long, you broach and you could lose a half an hour sitting there broaching, you can't get the boat back up. So you've never done that, have you? No, never, never. Yeah. It's never happened to me. Ever. <laughs> ever. I mean, Stretch made this point in the, uh, a few minutes ago, right? I mean, take your time uh, with those with those maneuvers and the best way to do it to the point uh, Steve and Nancy were just making is, is by by thinking ahead and, and being early on them uh, so you can take your time and it's not a panic situation. So practice, practice, practice. Yeah, I mean, those things happen, right? And that's how you learn, um, but you try to avoid them. I would add, um, uh, and this is sort of basic, but I, I, I'm thinking of where things have gone wrong uh, and it happens, but typically, uh, we're late with a maneuver or, or late with a, with a process because someone can't find it or there's other things in the way. And so Steve, you alluded to your gear bag. Um, <laughs> keep your shit in your bag, nope. you know? Um, <laughs> you know, put your stuff away, keep it where it's supposed to be. Um, another thing that helps, uh, and, this, and this happens on every boat. I mean, anytime I go race, particularly on a new boat, the first thing I do, is I grab a, a garbage bag and I start pulling things out of the boat, usually to the owner's chagrin. But there's too much stuff on the boats that we don't need. Get it out of there because inevitably um, it gets in the way at the wrong time or it's left out or whatever the case may be. So, you know, when you need, you know, your storm try, it can't be on the bottom of 7,000 sails, right? You know, and three sleeping bags and et cetera. It has to be right where you know it can be and you can grab it quickly when you need it. You know, same thing with the spare, you know, winch handle, whatever it happens to be. Um, it can't be buried underneath 17 spatulas, you know, and some red cups. Um, so um, keeping your boat organized. Um, I managed the, the, Mirage, the Santa Cruz 70 Mirage for 10 plus years. Um, it was a lot with 12, sometimes 17 people aboard if we're doing a, a day race. It's a lot of stuff. And it worked best when we really regulated what you brought. Uh, and we're careful about what you left on the boat. Uh, be thoughtful about, about that as well. Awesome. All right. This is always a good one. What are we going to eat? Um, you know, I, I, was, I was telling the, the other folks on the panel here, I, I've done uh, races where we've, where we've had enough food to come back to Chicago on the boat and still had leftovers. And we've had some uncomfortable situations where it's Sunday afternoon and you realize that you don't nearly have enough food to get you to the island. Um, so, uh, uh, Stretch, you want to you want to pick up there? I mean, I know you know you've, you've obviously <laughs> done this a few times, um, but uh, yeah. you want to pick up on on eating and hydrating? Yeah. So I'll tell you, the worst provisioning I was ever on was a Bayview Mac, where I sailed on this Ericsson Forty Six. They needed crew last minute. I came down after the Chicago map. And I was, I, I was like 19, 20, something like that. And they asked for 20 bucks to help kick in for food. I'm like, fine. 
And then all they bought was summer sausage, no, liver sausage, onions, uh, oh. and peanut butter. And, um, <laughs> and you know, I can, I can go with some of that, um, but that was it. I had one sandwich the whole time. I, I was worthless by the end of the race. So um, uh, our good friend, Tom Neal, that many of you will probably remember, another <laughs> 70 sailor, um, used to cat, like to keep it real simple, pre-made sandwiches, uh, and that was it. They would make, you know, how many, how many sandwiches do you need in a day? Four sandwiches. Everybody gets four sandwiches. Uh, it's going to take us 48 hours and that's how many sandwiches they would make. And why would they do that? Because that meant everybody spent the rest of their time racing. There wasn't, you know, taking people off to cook or et cetera. Now I've been on the other side where, uh, the boat prepared, you know, prime rib. It was delicious. It was wonderful. But did it take everybody, you know, kind of out of the race for a little while? Yeah, listen, I'm not going to tell anybody how, how to approach the race. There's going to be those that really want to be lean and, and, uh, and all in all the time and others that really want to have some, some enjoyable experience around it and the dining and the drinking with it as well. Um, but try and keep it measured. Um, it's a pretty quick race. I told you that, you know, I was pickle boat, you know, that was, and it was like an 85 hour race. I mean, you know, it's, I know last year was terrible, um, but the reality is, is most, most of the races are pretty short. So, you know, you plan for a couple days and then you can have an extra emergency meal. No one's going to die. You're all going to be fine. The most important thing you need on the boat uh, is water. And if you can create, if you convince the crew to keep the booze off the boat, that'll probably help too. Yeah, for sure. Just especially given the first story you told. <laughs> um, Nancy, Nancy, I mean, I, I know you, you all have a pretty structured way of thinking about packing a cooler, mm -hmm. uh, for the Mac race and sort of using frozen things you might eat or drink later as ice. You want to, you want to dive in on a little bit of that? So even though I was on a T10 all those years, I think I was the opposite of the four sandwiches. First off, it takes a lot longer on a T10 to do the race. So, <laughs> you know, something to break up the time. Uh, I always prefer pre-made meals portioned out in individual portions, but they can be fun. So I have done smoked pork tenderloin with plum chutney and aricot vert, but it's all pre-packaged in small loaf pans. It's in the cooler and people can go in when they want. You can end up eating all together if you want, whatever happens, but it's all pre-portioned. It's all cut up. It's just a fork and a container to the point of no cooking. The most cooking we would ever do would be to boil water or to filter water. Um, I hate taking all those plastic bottles. I much prefer everybody to bring their own Nalgene and a couple of gallon jugs and we filter water out of the lake into the gallon jugs. Um, so that's a bit of a production, but usually it's the off watch crew in the middle of the day when it's too hot to sleep anyway. So uh, in thinking about how to put the food in the boat, first off to a prior point that Stretch made, take off all the food that has accumulated from all the races so far up to the season, all the pretzels and the peanuts and the candy bars and everything, take all that off, start fresh, with what people think they will consume during the race. Now, I always used to have a party uh, a month before the race and before drinking started at the party, everybody had to sit down and we had to go through the menu. How many LaCroix are you gonna drink? Will you drink Gatorade? Uh, what snacks are you gonna want? What do you want late at night? Are you gonna be chicken soup or hot chocolate? What do you want? So we would lay it all out and then when it comes, we would divide it up among the crew. Everybody made something and everybody brings something. And on the morning of the race, you put frozen things in the bottom of the cooler first, and that would be orange juice and a gallon of water or whatever in the small containers of orange juice. They work great as little ice cubes. And then you stack stuff in the cooler by day. So we're gonna have uh, salmon on Saturday night. So it's gonna go on the top, but the pork is gonna be Sunday. So it goes on the bottom, that kind of thing so that you have, don't have to dig through the cooler every time to get to what you need because that cooler gets hot in a hurry. And I never did dry ice. The boat is so small that all the food turned out fizzy when I did dry ice because it was all too close to the dry ice. So you had to keep the cooler organized so that you were in it at a minimum. Um, but I like the variety of food on the boat, but it has to be pre-made. Yeah. 
Got freeze dried to works too. Freeze dried works. Yep. Got just about uh, five minutes left, so we're gonna keep this going. Otherwise, otherwise Sam and Taylor will give me the desk there. Um, Stretch talked about this a little bit, but what do we need to bring? This is uh, this is sort of a good one. Um, Steve, you want you want to want to get into some of this? I mean, I, I've been like I same thing with food, right? I've been on boats and people come and looks like they're packing for a you know two week vacation, and then other folks who get there and they realize they don't have a sweatshirt. It's cold in the middle of the lake in the middle of the night. So, Steve, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, as the British say, there's no bad weather. There's only bad kit. There's only bad clothing. <laughs> you know. So it, it's not too hard to. Early on, I, I would always bring too many clothes. So you just need a pair of shorts if it's warm. You need cold weather clothes. And if you're a guy, you, the, you know, you just need one of each. You might bring more than one. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just be prepared, be prepared for that, that cold weather up, up north and a dry bag and, and a uh, garbage bag inside of that. Uh, boots are a good I idea. I think it's the best idea. Uh, there's a thing called seal socks, which are waterproof. Um, and I've done it both ways. The thing about seal socks is they're not quite as warm as a boot. And then uh, when it stops raining, you got a pair of wet shoes that you got to put on because they got soaked during the rainstorm. So it's, it's nice to keep your other shoes dry. So I prefer to actually bring a pair of boots. Uh, sleeping bags, a lot, some, rarely have I actually needed a sleeping bag. Usually you need a sheet for when the, uh, the flies come out to cover your face so they don't eat you alive while you're trying to sleep. And that happens more often than cold weather, I think. Um, and then, yep, any clothes on the island, try to get have somebody bring them up for you, uh, not bring them on board. It's just extra weight you don't need to do and they could probably get wet and it's just uh, an annoyance. Do you have anything to add to that? Or? Um, we would always have two sleeping bags on board and sort of did the hot bunk thing because I get cold, especially if I've been tired and damp, wet. Uh, so I like a sleeping bag. Sleeping sheets are a must for the biting flies. You know, you don't think that there's gonna be insects out on fresh water, but those biting flies are fierce. Um, and I like lots of sun protection. I don't want anybody on the boat to get sunstroke. So I request that people bring a long sleeve shirt, um, at least one or two. Um, I always take, if it's a year when there's a lot of flies on the lake, I will take two pairs of slacks to wear. I always wear long pants because I'm sun phobic, but um, because I don't like to have fly guts everywhere on the clothes that I put on when I come up <laughs> off watch. So uh, one of the things I would say is there's a lot of skippers who are very weight conscious and they tell the crew, don't bring too much gear. I always tell the crew, bring what you're gonna to need to stay cool out of the sun, you know, and what you're gonna to need to stay warm. I don't, I mean, you know, I try to give them a packing list, but I don't, I'm not a weight Nazi. I really want people to be comfortable so that they can perform at their best. If, if I can, and we'll move to, to the last slide here then, but I think, you know, one of the things here is when you're thinking about who your crew is, Find make sure you've got someone who's done uh, this race or a, a race like it before, and if and ask them for their judgment. What did they need? What did they use? What did they see? Um, and you know, work off of that. Um, that the best the best tips I've gotten on clothing to bring come from folks who've done a bunch of Mac races. All right, last slide. How are we going to get home? This is that's me last year. Um, so there's a couple. <laughs> ways um uh you can sail back from mac that's a that's a good this is a this was a good time there's a bus that the cyc uh does you can if you are feeling fancy you can fly back um or you can hitch a ride uh, nancy you want to talk about the around the island race a little bit uh, as well which is also an option uh um i think it's on wednesday uh uh after the race i always i often sailed my boat back um i have uh, taken the bus twice and driven once. So uh, I prefer to sail back. It's a lot of fun, as Adam pointed out. It's a good time to take people who haven't done the race, but want some experience on being on a boat out on the lake. So that's really a good time to do that. Um, I was once stranded up on the island waiting for an impeller to come over from Irish and was asked by Jim Mitchell, who I'm sure many of us will remember, to do the round the island race on Vincitori um, with his near professional crew, it was really 
quite exciting and quite fun, especially when I got on board with my sailing gloves and my hat ready to go and they invited me to take a seat and handed me champagne and then proceeded to do everything on the boat. So it was really fun, um, but it does take a day. You have to stay up on the island an extra day to do it and then take off Thursday morning if you're sailing home to get back, but it's fun. If you're sailing back, I suggest the Michigan Shore. There's a lot of places to stop there and, you know, great restaurants and everything. You can hop, you know, just do day sails if you want to take the rest of the week. That's what we've been doing the last couple of decades, really. It's just sailing the boat back and taking our time. It's really nice. Beaver Island's a lot of fun. You can go. What do they call it when you go in the back of the truck and you drink all day? It's not Splunk. What is it? Well, no. Fun? It's a good time. Yeah. <laughs> Um, that said, I think we're, we're due for a break unless there's any questions, we'll just make sure. Um, boodling. Boodling. Yeah. That's not a word. That's what, that's what they do. Boodle. Right. Yeah. Boodle. I learned something today. It's a <laughs> Scrabble word. Yes, sir. Yeah. Good 24 hour, 100 nautical mile races was a uh, hook happens, race. Happens at the same time. As happens the at the same time. Uh, Michigan City is about 60 miles. Queen's Cup, I heard that Queen's one. Queen's Cup there. can be, yeah, Queen's yeah. Cup can work. A good one. Michigan City's, I've, I've always found, uh, you know, the summer can get hectic and get can get busy. I've always found Michigan City to be a good race because of the overnight component to it. Um, you know, it's sort of, you can drive it yourself if you want to, but um, usually it takes a couple people to get through it because it's overnight. But Queen's Cup's a good one. Mm -hmm. Or just go sailing. Just go sailing. You don't have to yeah. Right. Yeah. You could you could arrange a timed uh, a timed sail. Uh, make sure you reach out to the MAC committee chair in advance. But you could preset uh, a destination and a time, uh, record it, and uh, you know mark it on your log, etc. And you could share that data, and that that can work. That gets used oftentimes for some of the criteria for the West Coast races. Awesome. All right, Taylor, anything? Uh, Questions? Oh, yes, yes, sir. And Taylor's got some here. Okay, it's a question from someone who's new to fresh water sailing. Sure. What, what is it about this race? What is essentially different in this race from the other races? Yeah. So stretch, you want to take that one? I, I didn't question. quite hear it. Uh, stretch question was what's different about this race um, versus some of the uh, classic ocean uh, distance races for someone um, who's maybe new to yeah. freshwater sailing? Yeah, so um, the storms come up here faster. You get less warning, uh, which is a, a unique challenge. Um, also, the wave action here is very different than the ocean. Um, the waves are very short. They're steep. Uh, let's go back to 2018, why don't we? Uh, remind everybody of the start of the 2018 race. That was a ball buster. Um, so that would be a, a big feature. Um, and then while you do get some opportunities to do sea breeze and, 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 and shore breeze, et cetera, it's really a factor uh, in this race. It's a, it's a big factor on Lake Michigan. Yeah, the synoptic winds that you get in a grip file, if you're using expedition or software like that, which you probably use in an ocean race, are a lot less of a factor here. I mean, the, the, the time is too short and the shore breezes don't show up in the grip files. And that's really where your advantage is. And if you, if you have the conditions where you think you get a shore breeze, you get in there, you know, 10 o'clock and you're out of there at three o'clock, five o'clock too late, you're gonna get stuck in there at night and it's gonna be slow. So you know, those weather prediction programs don't get into that part of it. And that's, that's different. And the wave action is different. You know, Stretch did the uh, Transpac, what, three years after me or six years after me? Uh, two, no, well, well, no, two years after you, I think. Two, two years, yeah. 2019. And that no, was, 2017, I'm sorry, 17. Yeah, yeah, I did 13. So the conditions on the Transpac were a lot easier than Lake Michigan, surprisingly. Yeah. You get in that trade breeze and you just had these gentle swells and it was the same, you know, wind speed, all that, and you get uh, thunderstorms that blow through here. And we had a uh, FAR 40 in the, I think it was 2000 or something like that. And everybody was overlapped going into Grace Reef. And we had 60, I saw 62 knots on the anemometer. And we had a full jib and a full main and we were flying. We were doing, we averaged 25 knots on, a, it was just nuts. 
And you, you don't get that in the ocean too much, but you get these things, these, uh, these fronts that blow through here that really catch you off guard and have a lot of breeze to them. So. Yeah, in 2000, that's this, this back behind me, there were 10, there were 12 of us 70s all finishing within five minutes of each other from the bridge. There was a drag race from the bridge to the finish. The wind had died and you could see the storm coming. And when it finally came, it's exactly what you were talking about, Steve. One of the boats next to us demasted. Another one, Jai, broke their boom. Four guys lost shoots immediately. It was just carnage. And these are all really well-sailed boats. Yeah. Um, that You don't see that on the ocean. You would see it coming for a long while and you would prepare for it. And I think this brings up a good point of something we can all do during the winter is to uh, relearn or learn your navigation equipment so that you really know how to work your Garmin, you really know how to work Expedition or that kind of a program if you're going to use it, and really study the weather sites that you're going to learn to rely on during the summer. When you're busy, you're out sailing all the time, but yeah. in the winter is the time to find those weather websites and to start studying them and comparing them to actual conditions on the lake or from the buoys on the lake is what I mean during the winter. Nancy, I would, I would add on that, uh, make sure you have a backup system that you really know. We've gotten a little lazy in terms of the technology. It's wonderful. But I was doing uh, the uh, 600 down in the Caribbean and we came off a wave and our, and our rain app just came right off into my lap, you know, and, I'm, and we're short tacking into St. Martin. I'd never short tacked. I've never tacked the coast of St. Martin. And they're like, stretch, can we keep going? And I'm like, I have, I have no idea. Um, fortunately, <laughs> fortunately, I had an iPad that I loaded back, you know, software on and I popped it up. It took me 30 seconds and I got it. And we were able to, to navigate in a pinch until we could get everything put back together. Um, but you also got to make sure you really remember how to do charts Make sure you're making a, a real log where you're, you're putting down lats and longs in case you ever did have to reconstruct um, because the, 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 the electronic versions went out on you. I think that's something we get kind of lazy with. 